All right, this video is going to introduce you into some key topics of probability, um, which is what we will be talking about in this course for essentially the rest of the semester. Um, I like to focus more on data organization methods um, and counting versus trying to get bogged down in a lot of the calculations. I think that it's a lot more approachable with that method. Um, and so that is what I'm going to be doing here with um, my videos and with you guys. So just know that the probability is just trying to figure out how certain we are for outcomes to happen. Um, an experiment is any planned operation where you're controlling some of the conditions. Um, if you don't know the result ahead of time, then there's some chance like this could happen or that could happen. Um, the result of an experiment is called an outcome and the sample space is all of the possible outcomes. Um, we can list them, we can create a tree diagram, we can also do a Venn diagram. Um, a lot of times we use S to denote the sample space. So if you flip one coin, you could either get heads or tails. So that would be our sample space. Um, an event is any combination of outcomes. Usually we use uppercase letters like capital A or capital B for those. And so you'll see like the probability of event A, we write it as the probability of A, just like that. Um, probability has a long term relative frequency. So if uh, you flip a coin once or twice, you might get heads a couple times um, in a row. But if you flip it 100 times, then it should be getting really, really close to that 50 50 um, as long as your coin is fair. Um, probabilities can be anything between zero and one inclusive of those numbers. If your probability is zero, then that means that A could never happen. If it's one, then that means it's the only thing that can happen. And if it's 0.5, then it's equally likely to occur and not occur, like if you were to flip a coin. Um, again, there's another example, like if you go from 20 flips to 2000s to 20 times, um, the relative frequency will re get really, really close to 0.5. So let's say that our sample space is whole numbers from one to less than 20. So if I wanted to identify what that is, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, not including 20 because it says less than 20. Um, A is going to be the even numbers. So that's going to be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18. And B is going to be numbers greater than, greater than 13. So 14, 2, 19. Okay, we use this little squiggly bracket set notation to talk about like these are the numbers that are in the set. Um, so the probability of the sample space, well, that would be everything. The probability that you get all the numbers is all the numbers. Um, now, the probability that we get an even number would be the number of outcomes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, out of the total number possible. The probability of B would then be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 out of the total number possible. It does not matter if you leave your fraction or your numbers for probabilities as fractions or percents um, or decimals, they're all going to be the same. All right, let's look at another example that's organized just a little bit differently. So this is what we call a contingency table or a two-way table. And there are 100 students at the college. Um, if I have a two-way table and I wanna know what proportion are male, notice that I also have a separation by handedness. Um, so I might want to add off to the side these totals. So the proportion would be of male, let's say probability of male or proportion of male. Um, 
there is a question later that's like, how are they related? They, they're basically, they just mean the same thing. So that's what we would write it. All right, now if I wanted to do right-handed, well, it looks like there's 87. out of the 100 and left-handed would then be 13 out of the 100. And because this is a random sample, I can assume that this sample models our population of all students pretty well. Um, it's really hard to take a census or know the entire population of anything. And so I'm going to say here, yes, because it's a random sample. And so therefore, if I were to randomly choose any student from the population, um, I might be able to just use this proportion as a guide for what that proportion or that probability might be. So if I wanna to try to find a student at random who is male and right-handed, well then I could say that that's probably pretty stinking close to 43 out of 100. Let's look at how to organize this data with a tree diagram and then also with a Venn diagram. So we could split this by gender first. And you want to be really careful here because we actually want these to be the total of males and females. So the total number of males is 52 and females is 48. From there, you then have handedness. And we're going to have here a conditional situation. So like I'm already up the male branch. And so then I want to make sure that I'm like looking at the male row to split up that 52. So 43 would go here and 9 would go here. Similarly for females, I would have 44 and then 4. Now, if I wanted to do a Venn diagram, I want to show you a non-example first. Um, this is a trap that sometimes students will fall into is we're used to making this like comparison Venn diagram graph and we'll put male and female like so. Um, the problem with drawing your Venn diagram like this though is you're assuming that there is a group of people that would fall into both genders and I don't want to get into anything um, as far as that as far as getting too deep into this, but um, in our data set, everybody is, is binary, I guess is the best way to say it, right? So we're going to go with that here. So we can't actually do our Venn diagram like this. Um, instead, you might want to have them as two separate pieces because nobody would be in that intersection of the two. And then you might want to split these up maybe like proportionally even. So like 43 are right-handed and nine are left and four are left and 44 are right or something like that. Um, so a Venn diagram actually would not probably be the best way to organize this data. You probably would want to go with a tree diagram just because there is not really an intersection um, if you will. Now, uh, another thing that we could do if you did want to do one with an intersection is you could have male and then right-handed. Um, and so then you need to think about what each one of these pieces would be. So this would be male and not right-handed. So there would be nine in this piece. This little chunk would be male and right-handed, so 43 would fall in that piece. Right-handed but not male, so that would be right-handed and female would be 44. 
And then on the outside of that Venn diagram, you might have female and left-handed out here, so four. And then you could see that would make up your entire population of your students if you wanted to do it that way. Um, however, most students don't go straight to like, oh, I need to use both of my variables to make my two pieces of my Venn diagram. Um, they, again, try to do this first. Um, and you can't do that. So like this would kind of be a, a yucky version, like you have like a subset within your Venn diagram. Um, and then if you want the overlapping set, then this is what you would do. All right, the last piece of information here is about the fundamental counting principle. And you can use tree diagrams to kind of figure out the number of ways when something can happen. So if you have two different types of cars, five different colors on each one, and then three models of each one, and you want to know, well, how many different ways that could happen, you can just multiply the choices by each other. But a Venn diagram might help you see why that's the case. Um, five times three would get me these outcomes, and then I would have two sets of those to get me to the 30. So we can use Venn diagrams, we can use this multiplication model to find the number of ways in which you can choose things or make things happen.